Who is our God? He is the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, the Holy One, Yahweh. He is a miracle-working God. Rumors of this man spread throughout the land. People of every background heard the stories. Some traveled from afar, desperate to encounter his power and be transformed by his compassion. He is a miracle-working God. The one who fed the 5,000, the one who heals the sick, the one who brings the dead to life, the deliverer, the protector and provider. He is a miracle working God. Miracles are what he does. They are who he is. Miracles are his nature. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, we're coming into summertime. Uh, School is out and it's vacation time. Anybody planning a vacation this summer? Anybody wish you were going on vacation this summer? I get that feeling, that, that's me. Um, several years ago, Shan and I had a tremendous opportunity uh, to go with some lifelong friends to London uh, on a vacation. Uh, and it was unbelievable, such a gift from God. We got to see amazing things all over England. Uh, we got to tour Buckingham Palace. I actually have a picture, this is kind of like slideshow, you know, uh, with uh, you get to see all the pictures from my vacation. We toured Buckingham Palace. People think that's where the queen lives, but it's actually not. The queen spends a good deal of her time in Windsor Castle. Um, so we also got to tour Windsor Castle. And our friends that we went with, uh, he actually uh, used to work for one of those covert government agencies that goes by three letters. All true. Um, And because he did that, he got to know a lot of really important people in the world. Um, And so we were there touring Windsor Castle. He actually arranged for us to meet the queen. You know, the queen is uh, celebrating Jubilee, 70 years of her reign right now. Um, So we met the queen, and mostly he's talking to her. Uh, But in the midst of that conversation, she actually invites us to join her for dinner that night. Crazy. Like, I'm going, wait a minute, I'm from East Texas. Like, I, I, I don't even, I don't even know my, like, local representative. And I'm having dinner with the queen? <clears throat> right? So, so we go, we sit, and we're in this amazing, like, dining hall, and Everything's golden, it's crazy, and we're having dinner with the queen, and every now and then, uh, like, you know, I would be asked a question, and I would say, your majesty, your majesty, yes, your majesty, and at one point during dinner, she looks at me in the eyes and says, you don't have to call me your majesty, call me Elizabeth. Now, Vincent doesn't believe that. I, I actually have pictures I have pictures to prove it. Here's a picture of me with the queen. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then of course, there's Shanna with the queen as well. Yeah. Clearly, she was a little more interested in taking a picture with me. Um, just kidding. I, not, that didn't happen. I didn't meet the queen. I didn't have dinner with the queen. That's just Photoshop. Um, but often, we actually... We, we have a tendency to relate to God as if he is some kind of distant, powerful monarch. When God actually really just wants us to know him by name. That's why we are jumping into this series this summer. For the next 10 weeks, we are going to be talking about the names and nature of God. We're going to be looking into miracles from the Old and New Testament, but not just to celebrate the miracle. We're looking deeper to see how God reveals his name and nature through those circumstances in the miracles. So to keep us focused on what our purpose is during this 10-week series, we've crafted a declaration that we're going to all say together every Sunday to keep us focused on the point of this series. So it's going to be on the screen right behind me. I'm going to ask you just to wake up, stand up for a minute, 
read this along with me so that we all stay focused on the purpose of this 10-week series. Ready? Here we go. Miracles in the Bible and in daily life reveal the awesome name and nature of God. He does miracles to show us who he is and how much he cares. When we read or experience the miraculous work of God, we will respond with increased faith and sincere worship. God, I pray this morning that you would reveal yourself to us. We want to know your name. We want to know who you are. You are welcome, Holy Spirit, right now in this place to illuminate the name of the King of Kings. Welcome. Amen. Have a seat. We're going to begin today with God's first name. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. So as you're turning to Exodus chapter 6 on your phone probably, uh, maybe three of you brought actually a real written Bible. Either way, that's fine. Uh, Exodus chapter 6. Let me give you a, a little background so you know where we're picking up in the story. Um, in Genesis chapter 12, God calls a guy named Abram and renames him Abraham and says, I'm going to create a nation from your descendants. And that nation is going to be a blessing to the world. And then uh, through a series of just crazy, miraculous events, finally, uh, when he is really old, Abraham, in Genesis chapter 21, has a son named Isaac. And then Isaac, in Genesis 25, has a son named Jacob. In chapters 29, and everybody following? 29 and 30, uh, J uh, Jacob has 12 sons. One of those is named Joseph. Remember Joseph, coat of many colors? Maybe you saw the musical. Um, and he, he gets sold into slavery. Uh, somebody appreciated that joke. Thanks, bro. I appreciate that. Um, he gets sold into slavery by his brothers into Egypt, right? And he winds up over some time, again, miraculous events, running the country of Egypt. He's second only to Pharaoh. Well, there's a great famine in the land. Uh, his family comes, winds up coming in to live in Egypt to be saved by Joseph from the famine. Well, the story skips about 400 years and picks up in Exodus chapter 1. During this 400-year period, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have become slaves in Egypt. And they're working really hard and, and they're not treated well. Well, in the midst of their slavery and they're crying out to God, for rescue and relief, God miraculously calls a guy named Moses and orchestrates the circumstances of his life to lead them out of slavery. Well, that's where we're going to pick up today in Exodus chapter 6. Are you excited? Yeah, this is going to be good today. Exodus chapter 6, God is having a conversation with Moses, telling him about what he's about to do to rescue the people. So read with me Exodus chapter 6, verse 1. Actually, don't read out loud. Just follow along with me. Um, then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I, am about, what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. So essentially what God just said to Moses is, Hey, watch what I'm about to do. When God says, watch what I'm about to do, you really want to pay attention because it doesn't quite go the same as what happens sometimes when we say, watch what I'm about to do. I, I was reading this and I was thinking about when I was a kid, I had these two first cousins and we all lived out in the country, so they were my best friends. And uh, we often would say, hey, watch what I'm about to do. And then we would proceed to do something very stupid, right? Um, so... Uh, I was, this one point, uh, my cousins and I were in this, like, you know those playhouse things that you build, and they're like high up off the ground, and we climbed up on the top of that, um, and, and we decided we were going to do something really brilliant. We got an umbrella, 
And we opened the umbrella and we were going to jump off of the top of the playhouse and float down <laughs> like it's a parachute, right? And so I, I, it sticks really clear in my mind that my first cousin climbed up on the top of the playhouse, opens the umbrella and says, hey, watch what I'm going to do. And he jumps off. And it was not a parachute. It, it, it was like a brick, boom, and broke his leg. That's not what happens when God says, watch what I'm about to do. When God says, watch what I'm about to do, you can rest assured that something really cool is about to happen. So God is saying to Moses, hey, watch what I'm about to do. And um, so in verse two and three, um, he begins to tell Moses why he's going to do what he's going to do. So let's begin reading in verse 2. Really short little verse. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. Now, I want you to notice in that passage, and y'all, you guys sitting over here, you may need to watch this up on the screen, but when it says Lord... In that verse, it's in all caps. Why is that? Why do they write that? That actually happens in the Old Testament over 6,000 times that Lord is written in all caps. What does it mean? Why do they write it in all caps? Actually, the Hebrew word does not translate Lord. That's not the Hebrew word that's in the Old Testament. So why is that word there? Why do we put that in the Bible? This is something, by the way, that you really need to know, right? If you read the Bible, you need to kind of know what the words mean in the Bible. So we're going to take a minute and dig into this. And I just figured, I put the whiteboard up here because I knew some of you kids were already missing school. <laughs> and you just couldn't wait to get another lesson on a whiteboard. So that's, that's why we're doing this this morning. Um, okay, so in order to understand why that's written in all caps and what it means, we're going to look back really quick to Exodus chapter 3. And here's what's happen happening in Exodus chapter 3. Moses is out in the desert. He's watching his sheep. He's just cruising along. And he looks over and he sees a bush that's on fire. But the bush is not burning up. It's just burning. Now, he's a little curious. He's thinking maybe the heat's getting to me. Too much of that goat milk I've been drinking or something. And he walks over to the bush and the bush starts talking to him. Now he's really concerned about his sanity. Um, and the bush, through the bush, God actually calls Moses to go and get the people out of Egypt. There's a conversation. Most of you guys know this story, right? Um, by the way, Jimmy's going to talk more about this miracle story and the meaning of the name of God that comes out of this story later in this series. But I, it's just going to give us a little context of why this Lord is here. So let's start reading in Exodus chapter 3, um, verse 13. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? What, what is Moses saying? Like, hey, hey, um, God, uh, I'm going to go tell these people in a distant country. I'm just going to show up and say, hey, a burning bush told me to come get you. Right? I mean, think, put yourself in the situation. We all know the story, so we're like, yeah, I know what happened. But put yourself in the situation. Moses is, he's... He's not just a Bible character. He's a normal guy. He's sitting there in that situation, and the bush is telling him, hey, go get these people. He's got to be thinking, they're going to think I'm nuts when I show up and tell them a burning bush told me to come and get you. So he asked a very logical question. Uh, when they ask me, who shall I tell them sent me? Who do I tell them was talking to me through the burning bush? God's answer is fascinating, and it's the reason for Lord written in all caps. So let's see it in verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. 
Now, here's what the actual Hebrew word says in that passage. The first time God says, I am, just wave your hand at me if you've heard that before. God says, I am, okay? Here's the first thing in chapter, in verse 14 that God says. He says, Ehweh, tell them Ehweh sent to you. Ehweh means I am. But then he goes in the second part and he says, this is what you tell them. Tell them Yahweh sent you. What does Yahweh mean? Yahweh means he is. Because it wouldn't really make sense for Moses to go to the people and say, I am sent me. Right? So grammatically, God is giving Moses correct grammar. Isn't that cool? So God says to Moses, when you go to them, tell them Yahweh sent you. Now what did God just do? God just told Moses, this is so cool. God just told Moses his first name. See, what what we do is we just say God all the time. But there's all kind of gods out there. And everybody might say God. We know his first name. He said, my first name is Yahweh. That is incredibly, incredibly powerful that God wants you to know his first name. Well, um, so why then did it become Lord when written in Scripture? Because the Jews took the third commandment very seriously. You know the Ten Commandments? Maybe you saw the movie. Um, And the third commandment says what? Do not take the Lord's name in vain or don't misuse God's name. So the Jews took that so seriously that when they were sitting in synagogue and they're reading the Old Testament and they came to the name Yahweh, they would not say it out loud for fear that they might misuse God's name. And so when they're reading along and they get to it, they would actually say the name Adonai, which means oh, Lord. But not Lord like Lord. It means Lord as in master. And so they're reading along and they get to the name Yahweh and they would just replace it verbally with Adonai. And so here's what happens a long time because they didn't have printing presses, right? So they're handwriting and copying the Bible generation after generation after generation. And after a while, the scribes actually did us a favor. They did a favor for the people in the synagogue. They said, we want you, we want you to remember not to say Yahweh out loud. So they took Adonai This is, I I don't know if anybody else is going to find this cool, but I find this to be so cool. Anybody still, anybody interested? Three people, cool. Okay, so here's what they do. They take the A, the vowels from Adonai, and they put them in. And they make that word. That's what the scribes did. And the whole point of it was to remind you not to say the Lord's name out loud, not to say Yahweh out loud. But look at this word. Uh, When they came to it, they didn't actually say Yahuwah. They would say Adonai. Am I making sense? Is that making sense? But here's what happened over generations of copying the Bible and people translating the Bible is eventually Yahuwah Yahweh became Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah. Why is that important? Because every time you say the name Jehovah, how many, how many have heard the name Jehovah, God called Jehovah? When you say Jehovah, you're actually saying, in effect, God's first name. 
he is. And here's the way we often hear Jehovah. We say Jehovah Nisi, which means banner protection. Or we say Jehovah Rapha, which means healer. But when we say Jehovah Rapha, we're actually saying he is healer. Jehovah Shalom, he is peace. Jehovah, this is one of my favorites, Jehovah Shama, he is here. We are saying God's first name followed by his middle names, his descriptors. When we say Jehovah, I love that. That's God. He so wants to have personal relationship with me. He wants intimacy with me that he says, I'm going to tell you my first name and then I'm going to give you a whole bunch of middle names just so that you know me that well. That's awesome in and of itself. We could close and go home right now. But we're not because there's more. The very next verse, God says to Abram, something that is also just stunning. He says, I appeared to Abraham. This is verse three, Exodus chapter six, verse three. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Now remember, we we went through that earlier, right? That whole story. He says, I appeared to them as God Almighty. What does that mean? What is the, the Hebrew word for that? El Shaddai. Amy Grant. El Shaddai. That means God Almighty. Right? I I could sing it, but you wouldn't really want me to. So what God says to them, okay, let's read the verse again. God says, I appeared to them as El Shaddai, but by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself fully known to them. What is God saying to Moses in that moment? This is worth the price of admission today. God is saying, Moses, watch what I'm about to do. I'm about to do all of these miracles. They're going to call them ten plagues. I'm going to split the Red Sea. I'm going to rescue my people from captivity And the whole reason I'm going to do that is because for generations they have known me as some distant, powerful monarch, but I want them to know my first name. Amen? Really? What God is saying is I am about to do all of these things because I want my people to know that I am more than just a powerful monarch. I am their intimate father. I want to be on a first name basis with my people. Now, some people might say, well, that's, that's a little irreverent to say we're on a first name basis with God. And I can understand why you would say that. Um, but there is a distant reverence like the Queen of England like me calling her your majesty. But then there is an intimate reverence that you can have with people. Let me give you an example. My daughter, Sydney, a lot of you guys know her. She's, uh, yeah, she's pretty awesome. Um, You can all clap and cheer as much as you want. Um, Sydney is dating someone. I just let the cat out of the bag. Welcome into our family. Now you all know. She's been dating someone for, uh, for about three months or so, and I just got to meet him for the first time about a month ago. Uh, David, great guy. And so I meet David, and what do you think David called me? Hey, buddy. Hey, friend. No, no, he, he would not still be dating her if he, right? Um, no, I'm just kidding. David, you're awesome. So David actually called me Mr. Nichols, Right? It's, it's a distant reverence, respect. Now, my younger daughter, McKenna, has been married for two years to an awesome guy named Caleb. I uh, love Caleb. 
Uh, we've known him for years because they dated a long time before they got married. I've known him many years. When we see Caleb, when I see Caleb, what do you think Caleb calls me? Yo, dude. No, he doesn't do that. He calls me Weston. It's a little more familiar, right? It's a, it's a little more intimate, but still respectful. Now, Shanna's dad, that I have, uh, we, we've been married for approaching 31 years. Yep. Um, so I've known him a long time. And when I'm with Shanna's dad, what do you think I call him? Dad. Hey, Dad. How are you today? What's going on? It's an, and I'm going to tell you that Shanna's dad, I respect him more than any other man on earth. Is there a lack of reverence because there's intimacy? No, not at all. There's actually increased reverence and respect because I know the man intimately. That's the relationship that God wants to have with us when he says, I want you to know my first name. It is deeply reverent and it is also intimate. This is the thing I want, I think this is what God is saying to, to Abraham and I think this is the message for us today. So hear this, let it soak in. God is not there to make your circumstances more comfortable. Your circumstances are there as an opportunity for you to know God by name. We often call out to God asking for a miracle, asking for help as if he is the Queen of England. Can you please help your majesty? When we need something, we call out to God. God, will you help me with this? Will you help me with that? And God's like, yeah, I, I know that you know me as El Shaddai. But all the circumstances of your life, I'm not there just to make those comfortable today. Actually, those things are all in place so that I have an opportunity to reveal to you my name so you can have an intimate reverence with me. That good? Um, <clears throat> as I was thinking about this story and this reality, um, I was reminded of a couple of things that happened in uh, my life um, in which uh, I learned God's name and intimacy and reverence. One, I was in elementary school, and um, I, I had just met Jesus a little bit before, and I was actually riding on the back of a dirt bike with my brother. So I'm sitting behind my brother on this dirt bike, and I, and I rested my feet on the little, um, the little axle, the little pegs that stick out about this much from the axle, about an inch, right? And I've got my feet rested on those, and we're going down this bumpy dirt road. And I'm hanging on to my brother, and he's going really fast. And he hits a bump, and my foot slips off, and it catches in the spokes of the tire. It turns it all the way around, and the outside of this ankle, um, the chain and sprocket grinds off all of the meat and skin down to the bone on my ankle. You ready for lunch now? <clears throat> and it was horrible. Uh, I mean, just like hamburger, like the whole lower half of my ankle. And, and my sweet mom, I, I don't know how she responded when I finally got, got back up. And, but I think she called the doctor, and we lived way out in the country, right? She called the doctor, and the doctor told her to put some kind of concoction. I think it was baking soda and peroxide, but I'm not really sure. Somebody knows you're, you're seeing what's coming. You're picking up what I'm putting down, right? She pours that stuff all over my ankle. Now, what do you think my ankle felt like? Somebody just took a blowtorch, and they're just going at my ankle, right? It was on fire. And I remember, 
I was in such pain. I, I was running around the house in terrible pain, screaming, God, make it stop. Just make it stop. God didn't make it stop. As a matter of fact, for the next year, I wore a pair of cowboy boots with a hole cut out of the side because my ankle hurt so bad for a long time to come. God didn't make it go away. Now, fast forward 40 years. And once again, I find myself in a situation crying out, God, make it stop. This time, it's my youngest daughter, McKenna. She, this is just a few years ago. She had been in Indonesia with one of our teams for a few months. She comes home. She's having these really wild symptoms, like half of her body is just falling asleep. And we go to the doctor, and the doctors do a brain scan. Um, and they look, they bring up the picture, and the doctor sits us down and says, I'm sorry to tell you, but you see these spots all over McKenna's brain? That's not good. That, that's a sign of, of MS. And she's probably not going to have a normal life. And I'm crying out, God, in, inside, right? I'm crying out, God, make it stop. Make it go away. Please, God. The doctor said, um, I'm going to send McKenna to a specialist in Dallas. But it was actually like two or three months before we could get in to see the specialist. And I got to tell you, every day, all day long, inside, I'm crying out, God, would you please make it stop? We get to the specialist in Dallas several, like two or three months later. The specialist does another brain scan and comes in and sits down with us and says, I'm not really sure why you're here, but there are no spots on her brain. There's no indication of MS at all. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Why does God sometimes Why does God sometimes choose to do a miracle in a situation and not another one? I don't know. I wish I could tell you the answer to that situation, to that question. But I do know then in every one of those circumstances, whether God does something miraculous, or he's just present. He's just Jehovah Shema, and he's here. Whether he does a miracle, doesn't do what appears to us to be a miracle, the whole, every one of those circumstances that you are in right now, ultimately the purpose is God is saying, I want you to know my name. I want you to know me as Yahweh. I want intimate reverence with you. That's why this summer, for the next 10 weeks, we're gonna jump in and say, God, we wanna know your name and your nature. I'm gonna encourage you this summer to come with us on this journey, looking into the names and nature of God. We have resources available for life groups. Those will be emailed out. If your life group is not meeting this summer, connect with your life group leader because there will be resources that you can dig into with your family, with your spouse, with your roommates during the week to get to know the names and nature of God. Because ultimately, the circumstances of our life, God's not there just to make those comfortable. Those are there for the, so that God can reveal to us who he is. That's the journey we're going to take together this summer. To begin that journey right now, I'm going to ask that you stand with me. We're going to all pray together one prayer. I'm going to ask you right now, everybody in the house, 
just close your eyes and pray this one prayer with me. God, will you ignite the boiler room in my heart? Will you reignite a passion inside of me to know your name, to know your nature, to have intimacy with you again? Guys, I'm not joking, I'm not kidding. This is not just church talk for real right now. Deep in your heart, will you just pray, God, will you put a hunger inside of me to know you like never before? God, will you ignite the boiler room in my soul? God, I pray through this series, the next 10 weeks, that you would reveal yourself to us in ways that we've never known before. I pray that you would make us a people that don't just see you as God Almighty, but know you as Yahweh. God, we want to know your first name. We want to be on a first name basis with you. God, ignite the bullet room in our hearts and lives. Create a passion in us to know you this summer. In the name of Jesus.